Hi, this is Edward McCain. Uh, welcome to our presentation about endangered but not too late, the state of born digital news preservation. Um, <clears throat> I'm part of a research team that completed this report. Uh, we, we released it in April. So I work at the University of Missouri, uh, kind of in a dual position between the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute and University of Missouri Libraries. Uh, my purpose, one of my main uh, goals is to preserve born digital news content, not just the digitized, but stuff that's that was originally created in digital formats. And uh, we, you know, that has uh, not been until lately, I don't think a lot of attention has been given to it. So uh, that's me. I also have another member of our research team with us today, Neil Mara. Neil, you want to tell us a little bit about how you got mixed up in this uh, research? Sure thing, Edward. And hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Mara. I'm a journalist of 40 years um, in the industry. Uh, I've been uh, uh, a consultant and researcher uh, on this project, as well as a fellow at uh, the Reynolds Journalism Institute. Uh, but my background includes a lot of experience with digital and print uh, publishing workflows, technologies, asset management, archiving, and preservation. Much of that, um, most of that was with Clatchy. Um, I, I led a group that uh, uh, integrated uh, digital workflows for oh, McClatchy's 31 newsrooms. Um, and in the process, uh, took on the, uh, the, the task of preserving the content that had been accumulated at all of those newsrooms. So that's really where I got a lot of experience and, and I got to meet Edward and got involved in this project. And we're really glad that you did, Neil. So, yeah. all right, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna get on with it. First of all, you know, identifying what, what's the problem? What's going on? What is the state of Born Digital News Preservation? Um, the problem is this, when we shifted from digital, from analog to digital, the news industry was focused on many other things and, and didn't really address these issues that happen in terms of digital preservation. So uh, we, we say it forgot to ensure that. I think it was part, partly they forgot, but uh, there's also a lot, of, a lot of other issues that we'll identify and talk about in the report. So you can probably right off the bat, if you know anything about technology, you know that uh, <laughs> disk drives are physical objects. They don't last forever. Databases can be corrupted. There's a number of different ways that things can happen there. Backups don't always happen the way you, we had hoped that they would. Sometimes they don't happen. Sometimes they happen differently. Link rot is a huge problem in trying to access information over time on the web and metadata. Just basic having having basic metadata um, that over time can get lost, can break down, and make it really you know pretty much impossible to find a needle in a haystack. Neil, anything you want to add there? Yeah, um, well, these things are are uh, issues that I think many people in this uh, organization are are familiar with. Uh, we're talking here about uh, the news media. Uh, but this really is, uh, because of its importance, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but this really is a wider problem, uh, a problem that's really society-wide that we've uh, just begun to grapple with. But our focus here is on news as part of the public record. Right. Right there. Um, Vicki McCarger, in one of her reports uh, in back in the early 2000s, said this, and I, I really like it, digital preservation is like life support. Uh, once you start trying to preserve something digitally, you, you really can't let up. You have to keep it monitored. You have to keep migrating it to formats that you can access. It's a very long-term and intensive activity, uh, much more so than, than I would say uh, the analog process, analog preservation process. So as Neil was talking about earlier, we think that it's really important that news content gets preserved, digital news content, which is you know the primary form these days. Um, it's part of our democracy. It's, uh, we, we call it the first draft of history often. Um, 
It's an accountability, fundamental accountability mechanism for government, for large institutions, for corporations, and so on. Um, it's an antidote to fake news, which uh, erodes trust in not only in the news industry, but in other institutions as well, in society as a whole. And it's a primary source of information for journalists, certainly, but also in the scholarly record for scholars as they try to pull up and, and discern what's been happening in our society over time. There are commercial uses as well. It's valuable for a variety of different purposes in terms of revenue streams. And it's part of the public record. So this is, this is our community um, history often. The best source of that for a particular community can be in the news record, in the news content that, of, of that area. Neil? I just want to emphasize that last point, Edward. Um, the, uh, the, the record of, of the past and what's happened uh, as reported in, in local news organization um, uh, channels is really unique in every community. And that's why we think it's so important uh, that uh, this news be preserved and that we figure out new ways to preserve content now that it's all moving in the digital direction. So briefly, and people are probably pretty familiar in, in the analog world, um, archive was often basically grabbing a copy, keeping it cool, dry, dark, keeping you know bugs away from it. The timeline that we were looking at was in decades or perhaps in some cases centuries. Um, the idea of benign neglect, although not optimal, uh, often was, I would say, tolerated or accepted as part of part of the deal for um, archiving content. And this, this goes for news content as well. So for instance, pre preserving a newspaper or reel of film or some audio tape, uh, there, there was time, it wasn't necessarily urgent uh, that you know every, every year or every decade even uh, that get refreshed. And the long-term access is a big, thing you can you can open a newspaper from 100 years ago and you can access that content i don't think that's <laughs> we're not going to be able to say the same for digital content you know even in a, a couple of decades sometime or a decade or or a couple of decades we can lose access pretty darn quick to digital content Neil, i think that's a really good uh, point there edward um, and in the case of the, just the image on this slide, what we're seeing here is a, a picture of a uh, film can at uh, GBH in Boston when we visited. And um, as everybody says, you could open up that can, you can pull up a, uh, a frame on that, on that uh, film, and you can see what was in that film. Uh, you do the equivalent today with a, a, dr a disk drive, it's completely indecipherable, and it's entirely dependent on the, the software that reads that data. Right. So in terms of digital, I'm, I'm going to switch over and let Neil take the lead on on these slides, how digital is different. So this is just some examples of things that uh, uh, the, the, that we know and that we've learned through our research. Uh, digital is different in, in so many different ways <clears throat> uh, in its very fundamental nature, uh, but also in the way that it's accessed. Uh, 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 subscriptions are no longer uh, uh, ownership. Uh, it's really just a license to access. You don't actually own something and, and hold something physically. Uh, the new cycle has changed entirely from uh, the past. It's a 24-7 operation. News is constantly being updated. Uh, there are no distinct editions. There's no sort of demarcation lines as there used to be in, in the print world. Um, and, and broadcast world where a broadcast was done. Uh, there's so many channels and, uh, in the digital environment uh, and, it, and they're just proliferating and they're gonna continue to proliferate, we expect, uh, making this uh, so, so much more complex. Uh, the very uh, kind of, you might say atomic unit or atomic element of, of news is changing. It's becoming much more granular uh, than the article or the page or the newspaper or the broadcast. Uh, that was uh, the case in the past. 
And that's what makes the linkages between elements so critical. Uh, we now have many new digital news startups. These are, this is a great um, uh, trend these days in the news industry, you know, new ways of delivering news, new kinds of organizations, some of them uh, nonprofit. But what we're seeing is the, the process of creating news in many of these organizations really has no, um, uh, is not taking into account the preservation um, and in some ways is making the problem worse. And then we have uh, issues with the memory institutions, which were the backstop and, and in many ways, uh, the, the kinds of organizations that um, helped the industry in the past preserve its content. Uh, but uh, that is really no longer um, uh, as reliable because of the uh, issues of, of, of resources, both in the uh, uh, memory institution field, as well as in newsrooms. Yeah, I was going to say, we, uh, we were kind of uh, surprised by the, the fact that the digital startups were uh, not preserving as well as the, the older, more established uh, organizations. But uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. I, that, that could largely be a part of culture. Uh, yeah, yeah culture. like you say, it was not what we expected. Right. Um, we'll go back to the, the study to, to give a little, a little more background on that. Um, so this was, again, the Reynolds Journalism Institute, University of Missouri Journalism School and, and libraries, the University of Libraries here. Um, we, uh, we received a generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation that allowed us to do this research. Um, and just a little bit of background, we had a significant loss of news content back in 2002, which kind of got this whole thing started. It got uh, people at the journalism school very upset because there were about 15 years of mid-Missouri news content, cultural history that was digital and digital formats that was lost back then. But it, it, it got people to thinking and said, we really probably need to address this. We need to raise the profile of this issue because this, this is going to happen again. Um, so in the, the study itself, we wanted to look at the news industry. We got into a lot of newsrooms, we talked to a total, well, probably more than 115, but, but around that number, 40 some organizations. Um, we, at the beginning, this was pre-COVID, we were visiting newsrooms, talking to people, seeing, seeing how the organizations were functioning, various uh, newsrooms around the country. Uh, and then COVID hit, so we had to switch gears and did a lot of the, uh, the rest of the research by um, video conference and that sort of thing. Uh, we also, I should also mention that we talked with some memory institutions that are involved and preserving born digital news or news content, uh, including born digital. And then we talked with some of the firms, the technology firms that produce the technology that allows the content management systems and other parts of, of news technology to function, uh, which, was, which was really helpful. And they're, they're very interested in what's going on as well. So in, in total, we spent about 18 months from 2019 to 21, 2021 uh, researching this and pulling together this report. And, and uh, I would just uh, emphasize the, the piece that Edward mentioned that uh, quite a bit of this information we gathered was gathered on site at news organizations, newsrooms, um, uh, along with uh, memory institutions. And that was really yeah, extremely I, valuable. And we thank the, the, we really thank the people who were involved. They're busy people. They, were, they had a lot going on, but they're also interested in the long-term survival of, of the products that they're producing, the news content. Um, so what we found, um, we, we found that there was an interest, as we said, in the news organizations, all of them wanted to do something to preserve news content. They often didn't know what it would do, what to do or how to do it. And uh, as a result, there, there's some big chunks of news content that are still you know, today are not being preserved. And this is across, as we talked about, there's so many digital channels and that's expanding, but websites, mobile apps, um, and certainly images, video, audio, interactive elements, um, special projects, and then social media, which 
<laughs> social media is a really huge problem. Yeah. In fact, um, the social media, I think, is a good example of what we found. Uh, news organizations rely on social media to get the news out. Many uh, readers and consumers rely on social media to receive news and to direct them to news. But of all the news organizations we, we spoke with and interviewed and met with, only one was doing anything significant to preserve their social media content. So, and then in terms of our findings, uh, we, we had a lot of information to convey, a lot of, it, a lot of uh, findings from our research, but we broke it down essentially into these four different areas, content, tech, practices, and mission. And uh, Neil, uh, would you elaborate a little more on, on what we found in these areas? Sure thing, Edward. So in the content area, one of the key things that we found, this was again, kind of a surprise, was that uh, public media organizations uh, that we met with and interviewed were doing a better job in general than uh, private uh, news organizations. Although of course, private news organizations far outnumber the public organizations. Um, we, um, and here we're talking about in public media, we're talking about uh, say NPR stations, uh, PBS stations, um, uh, those kinds of uh, enterprises. Um, in technology, uh, we found a couple of very, very troubling um, uh, trends. One of them is that because of the financial difficulties news organizations are facing these days, just to stay af afloat, um, especially in the old, uh, the former newspaper industry, uh, we're seeing uh, cutbacks uh, across the board, um, you know, not just reporters and editors, uh, but in the uh, support areas such as uh, technology staff and systems. Uh, we saw a number of cases where systems used for preservation were simply no longer there because an organization couldn't afford to keep them going or the staff to, to run them. In addition, we saw this uh, the, uh, large, largely and uh, the absence of the former news librarians that we used to see in news organizations across America. Um, and that was a very troubling trend. And we'll talk more about that uh, soon. And as far as practices go, uh, what we saw was uh, almost no matter what organ kind of organization you're talking about, there was an over-reliance on the web CMS as a platform for preservation, kind of an assumption that uh, that the web CMS uh, was sufficient to preserve news content, when in fact, as uh, many of you know, a web CMS is not designed for preservation, it's designed for delivery uh, on the web, it's designed for speed, it's designed, uh, it's designed for performance. And it does that by uh, reducing the quality of content, especially visual content, the size of images, the quality of images, videos, sound, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is a big issue. Um, as far as mission, uh, we found uh, that there were uh, very few news organizations that actually had any kind of policies or written practices concerning preservation. And this is one of the clear distinctions uh, that we found because many of the public media organizations did in fact have clear policies. And so that, <laughs> that links back to that first one, the public media doing uh, a better job and uh, a, a we think a significant reason for that are these preservation policies. And I just want to also <clears throat> reiterate what Neil was talking about with the CMS systems, the content management systems. Over and over again, we would hear that is the archive. And we were like, well, that's <laughs> not really designed to do that. So challenges. Neil, you, you can go ahead. Yes. And so we wanted to dive a little deeper into some of the preservation challenges that uh, emerged through this research. Uh, and so um, many of them actually uh, stem from this, this, this first point uh, that uh, the digital, uh, the transition to digital for the news industry has meant this multiplicity of products, multiplicity of channels, kind of an explosion, you might say, of of, of outlets and, and streams of various kinds from the web to mobile to social to uh, all sorts of news feeds. I mean, for heaven's sake, you can even see news on the screen on your gas pump. Um, so th this, is, uh, th this is one of the major factors uh, that makes technology so much more central to the issue and to the process. Um, and, and, and the changes in the in news, uh, the, the, the structure of, of news itself 
far more important. Um, uh, and, and so what we found is that um, uh, this whole question of uh, the links between news elements um, uh, is much more critical than it ever was in the past. When you had a single product and everything was assembled and you could see an entire package of an article or a page or, a, or an edition or a broadcast, um, then it was a, a finite a finite thing. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. Now it's the things that connect the photo to the story on the web or in the, in the mobile app or in the news stream, connect the video to the story. Uh, those things become absolutely essential. And uh, we found in most cases, those connecting links are not being preserved. So the news cycle, of course, uh, we talked about this, uh, the, the lack of distinct editions makes it very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to uh, uh, standardize on, on uh, preservation processes. And then the loss of, of uh, newsroom librarians. Well, we found this was really kind of a striking finding that um, in many cases, especially in the newspaper industry um, and, and other types of news organizations, uh, there used to be news librarians everywhere. Uh, these were the experts. These were the, the preservation people. These were the ones who cared about this and were there in the, uh, the, the rooms when decisions were happened. And in many cases, they're not there anymore. And I'll give you one example, McClatchy, the company that I worked with uh, for many years, um, where there used to be a handful, um, up to several dozen uh, librarians in some of the larger newsrooms, you know, in Miami or Sacramento or Kansas City, the entire organization now across all 31 newsrooms, there's only one news librarian at the Miami Herald. And these are all the result of the struggles in the, in the industry. Um, and so we're just seeing impacts left and right from the, the struggle of uh, the, the news industry um, and, and the change in business models. So um, uh, again, diving deeper into this, um, uh, we see this uh, proliferation of uh, news content types. Um, and each of these has uh, unique challenges uh, in, in the structure uh, in, tech, in, in technology publishing systems and broadcast systems. Uh, and those have to be taken into account for preservation purposes. Um, and one of the things that we saw uh, to, as a way to deal with this is uh, an expansion in the number of systems um, that you see as part of the publishing and broadcasting process. And so, it's a, again, a proliferation of systems, um, often uh, systems that are channel specific to one particular channel, a video channel, an audio channel, podcasts, for example, um, uh, not just uh, the web and mobile apps. And this fragmentation has made uh, the, the problem much more difficult because you have different things going on in different systems, all drawing from, say, an original uh, content source. Um, this point about uh, the de-emphasis of print is, is really critical, and it's something that we, we want to draw attention to because many of the practices of the past uh, that we still see in place rely on print editions in the, for, for newspaper content um, uh, as, as the archive um, um, method of, uh, of record. And but what's happened in the digital era is that there's been this gap that's just continued to grow between the amount of content that is published digitally and the amount of content that makes it into print. Um, that can be, in many cases, in best, the best news organizations that still have healthy print products, maybe 70, 80 percent. But in others, it can be as little as 40 or 50 percent of what's published digitally. So that has a big impact on uh, processes that rely on print. What it means is, for example, um, uh, the, 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 the interest in and the, and the focus on uh, the, the e-edition version of print products um, really means you're gonna, if, if that's something that's being used as a preservation mechanism, uh, it's gonna miss a lot of content uh, that was never published in that print product. So these yeah, things should, are very, very yeah, important. Should, yeah, we should probably clarify that this e-edition is a, uh, it's kind of like a PDF or it's a ver variation of a PDF. And that PDF is derived from the print edition, not from, not from what's online, not what's on the web. That's right. So if you're in many cases, like the Library of Congress and uh, other memory institutions, the uh, what's being preserved is the PDF of the print or some version of a P PDF of a print edition 
which is not a complete record of what was really, you know, the news organization was was publishing. It's just a portion of it. Sorry. No, no, good point, Edward. Um, one other thing we want to talk about here is this uh, last bullet uh, on system migrations. Because of the complexities that we're, we're, we're touching on here um, in workflows and systems um, and metadata, uh, what, we, what we saw in talking with newsrooms is that many of them uh, report having significant issues with the loss of content during migrations from one system to another. And in this time of upheaval with you know, growing numbers of channels and systems, uh, this kind of migration problem is uh, proliferates. It's happening everywhere. Um, and translating content from one system, you know, proprietary structures and databases to another, uh, often results in the loss of content, the loss of parts of the content, the loss of metadata. It's a major kind of um, uh, red flag for news organizations to be careful in those transition periods. Yeah, just one one example of, of that, you know, content losses. I, we saw a situation where <clears throat> systems were being migrated, and they actually, at a certain point, like two thousand eight or something like that, said any publication date prior to that, we're just going to ignore. Well, <laughs> if you don't know when the when this was published, it really hampers the, you know, it really diminishes the information quality. You you know, it really uh, makes it difficult to figure out when was this published when was it created right so recommendations and we had three general areas we had the the first one was immediate actions we tried to to get things together pull things some ideas together for how news organizations could could do this without spending a lot of money or a lot of time they could just jump right into it so um neil you could elaborate on how at least some of, of what we suggest for immediate actions. Right. Um, so here we're talking about uh, preservation policy as really the number one item uh, because it correlates so closely with uh, news organizations that are doing well. And, um, and so we see it as a very important thing because of the uncertainty and the, and the, uh, the, you know, the lack of, of, of the, say, news librarian role in many newsrooms. It's more important than ever to have a policy that states what you're going to preserve. And how that's <clears throat> how that's going to be done, um, and one way to get there is to tap somebody to be responsible. You know, with the the, the loss of librarians in in news organizations, there's got to be somebody paying attention. And we found a number of cases where there is no longer anyone paying attention. So that's a a key recommendation um, that we thought was important. And then um, establishing a plan for unpublishing. This is a, a new area uh, that's a, a result of the digital. Um, uh, uh, you know, a proliferation across society where many people are concerned about privacy and hiring uh, reputation management companies to uh, uh, pressure newsrooms to remove content that might be embarrassing. Uh, well, many news organizations uh, really aren't aware that, that these kinds of uh, these kinds of things are happening because they might hit a low level person and somebody will, oh, sure, go ahead and delete it. And so a lot of newsrooms really don't have um, uh, establish processes for this. And so it's very important uh, because it affects that, that actual public record uh, that, that this be um, uh, done intentionally and uh, with clear policies and procedures. Yeah, that, the, the unpublishing thing is, is really uh, gaining more and more attention in the news industry. I'll say that it's really important to look at. So our, our, our second set of recommendations were a set of mid medium term, shall we say, actions that will they'll take longer to accomplish. They may need to be invested in. They may take some money or pull, pull in some tech staff or something. But they're really uh, essential to making progress towards digital preservation. And Neil, you want to get the, the details on that? Yes, thanks, um, Edward. Uh, so where where the um, uh, the previous slide and recommendations were kind of you know minimum immediate steps, <clears throat> here we're talking about things that are much more fundamental and permanent. Um, you've got to have control of your metadata. Uh, so we're recommending the news organizations really dive uh, deep into just review it because in many cases it's it can be changed and modified and processes can can be uh, uh, configured to preserve more metadata. 
uh, if somebody's just working the process and paying attention. Uh, clarifying ownership is very important because as we look to the future in this continued proliferation of channels, uh, you, it's, it's, it's very important to understand and uh, you know which content you can actually you actually own so that you can know what to reuse, what you're able to reuse. And in, uh, this is this is more difficult than it may seem. Uh, in news organizations, content comes from all sorts of places. It comes from your own staff members, reporters, photographers, videographers. Um, it comes from um, uh, from uh, freelancers. It comes from uh, wire services, from syndication services, from the general public. Uh, from institutions and businesses, all kinds of sources. And you've got to know what, uh, what the, the ownership and, and uh, the um, rights, uh, rights are on all that content. Uh, so we suggest also that uh, news organizations run a self-assessment uh, without somebody paying attention. It may not be clear um, that uh, these things are going on. So we're recommending that leadership in newsrooms just run a little test, go back a year, Pick the, most, the biggest news story of uh, the previous year and see if you can get a hold of uh, the original content elements for all of the news coverage that you published on that big, that big story. Uh, the original photos, original videos, um, original materials, the full length of, of, of text um, for all channels. Can you actually put your hands on that? That's what this is about. Put your hands on it. And as you were saying, Make sure that you have the rights to use it. That you have the rights to it, exactly. <laughs> All that, that metadata, yours. see? Yeah. yeah. And then this last point is really kind of a, uh, the most important sort of forward-looking uh, step. Is you, it's, We really found that uh, in order to do this properly, news organizations have to have some sort of system dedicated to preservation. Uh, the reliance, again, on uh, web CMS is really, it just isn't going to work because the web CMS has a separate purpose. Um, its speed of delivery um, and, it, and 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 the uh, the waste content is structured for the web is 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 not the way it's needed for uh, preservation. So an asset management of some sort is really going to be essential if you're looking to preserve content permanently uh, going forward in the digital era. Essential, exactly. So, talking about asset management, some best practices. Um, Neil, you want to jump in on this again? Right. So we thought we'd share some of the, um, uh, the best practices we saw in asset management, because again, this is such a critical area. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, we, we see it's very important that you pay attention to workflows and build workflows in a way that reduces or if possible, eliminates duplication of content. This is a big issue with web CMSs because people are, are taking the same photo and throwing it into the web CMS today. And then when the story runs again tomorrow and the story runs next week and a month from now, uh, that same, let's say, you know, crime story or murder or election or whatever, you've got um, numerous duplicates of content. Which one's the original? In many cases, nobody knows. So you've got to set up a workflow that avoids that. And it's really possible to do. Uh, you want, uh, as a best practice, to preserve the full text um, uh, in, in all channel manifestations, you want to see that those differences because it might content may need to be modified for a certain channel, mobile, for example, social media. Uh, you want to preserve all that. Um, for visual uh, information, um, it's really important to uh, have systems that allow you to preserve the highest quality of your still images, video, graphics, and active media. Uh, there's so many more kinds of active media these days, maps and interactives and so on. Um, uh, those are very difficult to preserve and those are going to keep continue to grow. But keeping these, the, these kinds of content permanently at their uh, highest resolution, and their, their, their uh, lowest compression levels um, uh, is, is really becoming critically important. So the linkages we've already talked about, um, if you preserve the linkages between content, and the packaging information on what went in on the web and in and in mobile and so on, and uh, and you have that original content, uh, you can recreate um, uh, something close to the way that original content was published in each channel, and that's really the goal, we think, for proper um, uh, digital preservation. And then lastly, lastly, we think it's important 
um, that uh, uh, pub, uh, preservation be integrated with the publishing workflows rather than as a uh, process after the fact, uh, because the, the, the higher the bar uh, to making preservation happen, the less likely it's going to happen with, you know, busy staffs and, you know, uh, very, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, low resource newsrooms and, 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 and preservation groups. Yeah, it should be, we, we think that this should be integrated and in, in sort of an automatic thing so that people don't even have to really think about it. They right. don't have to be doing it themselves uh, individually. Or manually, right. Or manual, yeah. Um, additionally, you know, some of these may seem obvious, but you've got to have uh, really the best possible metadata. So we wanted to provide some uh, detail on that. Uh, so not only do you want uh, the origin of your content, you want to know where it came from, the authorship, the institution, you want to have the full rights information and licensing terms. Um, but uh, you've also, uh, we think, need multiple kinds of descriptive metadata uh, that allows you to identify content uh, by what's in the content and not in necessarily in ways that are specific to a particular channel. For example, not necessarily the web navigation um, which is often associated with news content because that changes. It changes so often. Um, but you want uh, uh, th that descriptive metadata uh, that's going to be permanent. Um, and you can, there, is, there, are, there are standards out there that can be applied. Um, and, and the use of multiple taxonomies is actually a good idea because those may be needed and applicable for different purposes in the future. And then, of course, uh, change tracking. And here we're talking about post-publication. You know, not the version management as things are being created, but what happens to content after it's committed to a repository or an asset management system. It's critical that this be tracked so that everybody knows what happened whenever content is changed, including um, these unpublishing processes. It may be okay to change something, uh, but you want to be able to know who, who did it, when it was done, why it was done, um, and what exactly was changed. Yeah, and ideally on the unpublishing, it would be best to be able to go back and see everything that happened and not have certain things deleted from the system entirely. You want to be able to go back and see, oh, this is what we did. This is who we, you know, this name, we removed this name or this was the charge that, that brought this up. So in terms of workflow, so one last uh, set of details on uh, best practices. What we saw um, in asset management and, and, and you know in the, in the best news uh, organizations um, in terms of what they do for for preservation are these kinds of things. What we saw tends to point toward a modified or improved uh, architecture that um, is set up to ensure that content gets preserved again, as we talked about and Edward mentioned, as automatically as possible. Uh, regardless of where content originates, what device content originates in, or what system content originates in, uh, because that's going to continue to, to, to expand and to grow. But you want a process that, that uh, at a certain point, uh, takes the con all, that, all that content um, and preserves it as a master copy in your repository or your asset management system. And if you do that properly, and if you uh, uh, preserve not only the content um, at its highest resolution, at its best quality, but also the links uh, that, that allow you to package that the way it appeared in each, in each channel, um, uh, in other words, focus on the core content, then you don't necessarily need to, to, to preserve uh, every web page because the web pages, uh, frankly, are changing all the time. The structure, the appearance, um, uh, the organization. I mean, web webs websites change constantly. Um, mobile apps change constantly. So what you want is that original content um, along with, we think, the planning information um, because that's really a good source of, of, of uh, descriptive metadata. And if you do this, if you kind of move toward this kind of uh, improved architecture of systems, we think that allows that would allow news organizations uh, to use their, their channel specific systems, say the web CMS, um, to optimize for the thing that it's most needed for, which is speed of delivery, um, and not worry about um, 
any preservation elements because it would always be only a copy of the content that's in that repository. So you have that, uh, that new uh, duality where content is preserved at its highest and best quality with all linkages and then channel specific systems can focus on channel specific needs. And then the, in terms of recommendations, the third leg of those are these industry-wide bigger, bigger ideas, long-term uh, thinking that uh, may involve policy changes and partnerships between the institutions. Um, so certainly collaboration across the industry, Neil, there's no exactly. reason why, why that couldn't happen. Yeah, we see we see the opportunity for for news organizations to be you know much more open uh, in terms of sharing and collaborating on preservation processes, you know possibly even pooling resources uh, to preserve uh, certain kinds or segments of, of of news organizations can work together to 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 share common preservation resources. Well, and we're uh, seeing newsrooms collaborate. You know, all, it's all kinds of new stuff going on in terms of collaboration of the newsroom. So this this would seem to maybe tap into that trend. It does fit into that trend. You're seeing newsrooms, uh, news collaborations uh, all over the country. Um, in terms of uh, uh, preservation technology, uh, what we found is um, many of the providers of technology are actually a lot, uh, very interested in this area, uh, but they haven't heard as much uh, about preservation functionality and systems and capabilities um, as they thought they would from their customers. And so we think it's important to advocate for that so that that, kind of that, that technology is improved um, and does a better job of, 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 of doing the things that preservation needs for uh, uh, preserving and, and maintaining for the long term uh, the digital news content that we're creating. And then lastly, uh, we do see an opportunity here for uh, partnerships uh, between the news industry and a number of institutions. Um, in particular, we think there's a, a natural partnership uh, with libraries. You know, libraries are, are uh, an institution that exists in almost every community, you know, right there side by side with news organizations, with local radio stations, newspapers, perhaps the digital startups that are, that are coming, uh, that are arising in, in, in communities around the country. Um, and there's a natural uh, 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 alliance of interest there uh, that we think is important because you know libraries care about this. this so these have been the institutions that have preserved you know much of the public record um, you know for for centuries, um, uh, but they're 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 struggling too in terms of resources. But working together, I think there's a there's a real future for those kinds of partnerships with news Just organizations. Just as an example, I think it was fantastic what happened at the Denver Public Library. And that was, uh, you know, because of a relationship between the Denver Public Library and the Rocky Mountain News. The Rocky Mountain News in Denver uh, closed, I think, in 2009. And the, because of that relationship between Denver Public Library uh, and uh, Scripps, the owner of the, of the newspaper, there was a full transfer of the ownership of that content, and that has been preserved for the record, you know, in the Denver Public Library archives online for posterity. And that, that's a great success story. Great example, Edward. Yeah. <laughs> so we've touched on, you know, a good bit of, of what's in the report, but there's a, a lot more that you can learn about digital news preservation from the report. If you go to rjionline.org slash preserved news, you can get the full report. There's contact information for, for me and I can put you in touch with Neil. I'm not sure. Neil, I think you're on the RJI website as a fellow. So right. anyone who wants to get a hold of this, go ahead, uh, go to the rjionline.org site and you can find the report and our names. And uh, we thank you for your attention. Appreciate you joining us. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your interest.